Our speaker tonight is Dr. Dikran Kalikan. Dikran has written numerous articles and given talks on a wide variety of subjects in modern Armenian history. He has taught at Clark University, Regis, Westfield State, Wheaton Colleges. He is past chairperson of the Armenian National Committee of America, Eastern U.S., and he is the managing editor of the Armenian Review. Most importantly for tonight's purposes, Dikran is the author of Armenian Organization and Ideology Under Ottoman Rule, 1908-1914, which is adapted from his dissertation written at Boston College, from which he holds a doctorate in history. And the book came out last year from Transaction. It is, as far as I know, the first book of its kind, a detailed study of the relations between an Armenian political entity, in this case the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, and the ruling Committee of Union and Progress. It's a very significant work in its own right, and one hopes that it paves the way for other works of a similar nature, examining other Armenian political and social entities in the late Ottoman Empire, and makes that make extensive use of primary sources, as Dr. Kaligian's book does. And as soon as I heard that this book was coming out last year, I wanted to have him come and speak for Nasser. It took a little bit longer, than I had hoped, but I'm sure it will be well worth the wait, and I'm very glad that the weather allowed us to hold the event, because when you schedule something in January here, you're kind of rolling the dice. So, thanks for coming, and please welcome Dr. Deep Ground Kalika. Thank you, Mark. Um, as Mark stated, I'll have to lower these. I wish I was that tall when I played basketball. But, um, my book looks at the ARF, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, a touch Oxygen, during the years of the Ottoman constitutional rule just before World War I, and in particular its relations with the Committee of Union and Progress, the CUP as I call it, you know, in Turkish, Itihad ve Terake, the ruling Turkish party during that time. Um, and the reason I cover this particular topic, well, there, there are a few reasons. I mean, you know, we, there's been plenty of research, and, and there should always be more, but there's been lots of research on the, on the period of the genocide. But the years immediately before are critical, because, I mean, the party that will, that will end up implementing the Armenian genocide is the CUP. And yet, as early as, as you know, as, during 1908, 1909, the CUP was actually allied with the Armenians and particularly with the ARF. So how do you go from two parties, both revolutionary parties, both working to overthrow Sultan Abdul Hamid to just a few years later, one committing genocide against the, the people of the other? That was the question I wanted to look at. I think it's an important question. And in particular, because it applies to so much of the historiography that we see. Uh, if we look at the, the general Turkish government-sponsored historiography, uh, whether you're talking about the, you know, the Justin McCarthy's or the Gunter Louis, or if you go all the way back to the granddaddy of Turkish denialist, uh, genocide denialist uh, literature, Esat Uras, the, uh, who uh, wrote, wrote basically the Bible of Turkish denialism, they, they basically have a, a general pattern for this period in explaining how, you know, why, of course, there was no genocide and why it was justified. And it actually starts with the, with, uh, the Adana massacres, which is the single biggest event that takes place during the period that we covered and which we discussed here a few months ago, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Adana massacres. And in, by that point of view, the Turkish government point of view, they blame the Adana massacres on a natural reaction of the Turkish population to an Armenian uprising in that city. Likewise, according to that view, the fact that the ARF and the Hunchak parties really only made a show of solidarity with the CUP. Yes, they were allied, but it was really phony. And in fact, after the first few weeks after the 1908 coup that brought the CUP to power, they resumed their disruptive activities. Their main aim was to, and I quote, arm their supporters and prepare fortifications, unquote. The ARF is seen as having infiltrated all Armenian churches and organizations, as well as having both regular troops and guerrilla bands in service and ready for rebellion throughout this period where supposedly they were cooperating. 
Thus, with the outbreak of the First Balkan War, the ARF took advantage of the situation, broke off relations with the CUP, and started again to demand that Europe, and especially Russia, intervene and force the Ottoman government to institute reforms for the Armenians. And according to, again, this, uh, this pro-Turkish uh, view, the one and only aim of the ARF was to incite a full-scale rebellion against Ottoman rule, the opportunity of, for which came with the arrival of World War I. That's the Turkish view. Now, when you consider that, and when we look at the, the general thing, it's therefore the position of what the ARF was doing and what their position was regarding European intervention in the Ottoman Empire is a significant issue with these conflicting interpretations in the historiography. So my book traces ARF policies and initiatives to answer this important question whether or not the party and the Armenian community in general largely remained loyal to constitutional regime and only resumed their appeals to Europe after the government's repeated failures to implement promised reforms. This has been the position of whether it's uh, Richard Hovhannessian, of Stepan Asturian, a number of Armenian historians, but no one had really gone into the primary documents of this period in order to make a, a more definitive uh, response. Now this is a critical issue, these European interventions, because the nationalists in the CUP and in the uh, government considered any European intervention to be a significant blow to their national pride and honor. Under the Sultan, appeals to Europe were often met with Muslim mobs being instigated to riot and massacre Armenians. And so I analyzed this period looking, one, at the European consular archives, whether it's especially the British government, the British consuls, what they were writing back to their government regarding what was happening throughout the Ottoman Empire, also the United States consuls and the French consuls. But in most detail, I look at the archives of the ARF, which happen to be located a couple miles from here at the Heidenick building, and I look at the circulars, the correspondence, and the minutes of the ARF, particularly its branches in Constantinople and in Erzurum, which determine policy towards the Ottoman government and Turkish parties for the Western and Eastern bureaus of the ARF, respectively, the two bureaus being the governing bodies of the ARF. So, what I'll be discussing today will be largely drawn from letters between some of the key leadership figures which give vital insight into their thinking and analysis of political events. Say when Rostam writes to Zavadian and vice versa, two of the three founders of the party. Correspondence from ARF bodies and field workers in the eastern provinces and in Gilgia provide reports of events like the Adana massacres, like attacks and pillaging on Armenian villages. Uh, and reports by the bureaus to the ARF World Congress and their periodic letters to their different central committees around the world provide analysis and rationale for what the two, uh, what the two bureaus were deciding to do. Why are they taking these particular actions? So this is the, 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 this is the foundation. These, these are the sources that um, I have drawn from in, in producing this book. Um, and so to to explain, basically, we have to go back just a couple years before, um, or a few years before, where beginning in 1900, the ARF and the Vera Gazmiel Hinchagyan party entered dialogue with the Turkish, op with Turkish opposition groups, like the CUP, in Paris in 1900. Both parties took part in the first Congress of Ottoman Opposition Forces in 1902, together with Turkish, Arab, Greek, Kurdish, Albanian, Circassian, and Jewish representatives. At the end of 1907, there was a second one of these Congresses, in which resolved to overthrow the Sultan and restore the Ottoman Constitution using radical means, uh, including refusal to pay taxes, propaganda, and armed resistance if necessary. The Ottoman Constitution had been suspended, had been established for one year in 1867 and had not been used since. Thus, when there was a successful constitutional revolution in 1908, led by the CUP re-establishing constitutional rule, it was initiated by, not by these opposition parties, but by the Turkish army in Macedonia. It was greeted by jubilation by all these opposition parties even though they most were not directly involved, and by most of the population of the empire. According to one ARF leader, Mikhail Varantian, all of Constantinople rippled in unusual enthusiasm. The ARF published and distributed a proclamation that celebrated the success of the revolution, 
and looked forward to freedom, equality, and justice under the constitutional regime. Accordingly, the party published a program that recognized the territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire. The program called for a federal form of government with decentralized administration that would provide the widest degree of local autonomy. And then prepared a list of demands to be presented to the, uh, the new Ottoman parliament that was to be elected. The CUP and the ARF thus became key players in Ottoman constitutional politics. For the ARF to influence government policies to improve conditions for the Armenians, it would have to work closely with the CUP, which was the leading party. Communications between the parties was immediately hampered, however, by the fact that neither was headquartered in the imperial capital of Constantinople. The ARF Western Bureau would eventually would soon establish a Turkish section of itself in Constantinople. Constantinople to address this problem. The CUP headquarters, however, stayed in Salonika, in Thrace, and though the ARF would meet regularly with the CUP ministers in Constantinople, if the two parties wanted to meet, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, the ARF would actually, the, the ARF Bureau would actually have to send people to Salonika to meet with the CUP he uh, headquarters there, or their central committee, I should say. At the end of 1908, elections were held throughout the empire and a multi-ethnic Ottoman parliament was seated. Uh, it had 283 members, which included 53 Arabs, 27 Albanians, 22 Greeks, a number of Slavs, Kurds, Jews, and 11 Armenians. 11 out of 283, which is a significant number. Four of them were ARF members representing the eastern provinces. Uh, others were from different parts of the provinces, and two actually represented the Armenian community in Constantinople. The restoration of the Constitution allowed all the Armenian parties to openly campaign in the elections and to start publishing their newspapers within the empire, where for years they, they smuggled them in. But in this atmosphere of increasing liberties, an armed insurrection, or counter-revolution in fact, broke out in April of 1909 in Constantinople and succeeded in driving the CUP out of the city. Liberal opponents of the CUP, as well as reactionaries and supporters of Sultan Abdul Hamid, supported this coup. However, within two weeks, uh, supporters, uh, uh, troops under Mahmoud Shevket Pasha, had suppressed this revolt. But, taking advantage of these political unrest, anti armenian massacres broke out in the city of Adana and its surrounding towns and villages within the province. And, as we heard several months ago, this would result in some 25,000 Armenians being perishing in two separate rounds of massacres. Now, the Adana massacres created the first major test of, for ARF-CUP relations. The ARF had to decide, in the face of Armenian public opinion, whether to continue its cooperation with the CUP based on what had happened. This was dependent on one hand on an evaluation of the degree of culpability of the CUP. On the other hand, the ARF had to weigh the substantial potential benefits to the Armenian community and to all Armenian citizens if the CUP instituted a true constitutional regime. They'd only been in power for a few months so far. Now, the impact of the massacres were, were of course, felt far afield from Adana. Both the ARF and the Armenian population at large, drawing on past experience, knew that this could be a harbinger for you know, more massacres to take place elsewhere. So the ARF is in, found itself in a serious dilemma. They were torn between their solidarity with the progressive elements within the CUP and their revulsion at the murderous acts of its chauvinist elements, existing in the same party. The Western Bureau desired to help the progressive elements consolidate their power within the party and the empire. Yet should these progressives lose the upper hand, or if in fact all their professions of faith and constitutionalism and an equality for all peoples turn out to be empty gestures just to win ARF support, the consequences for Armenians they knew would be deadly. The self-defense units, the Fedais, that had, had, had protected the Armenian population before constitutional rule had been disbanded. As you might expect, you can't expect to be a, a, a party in parliament and have your own military arm. So they disbanded them, which would therefore leave the population in the eastern provinces and in Giligia undefended if all the promises turn out to be false. In the end, the most important considerations that had to be weighed were the direction of the CUP, its political position vis-a-vis -vis the opposition, 
And the impact on these if the CUP ended cooperation. So, in fact, if you read the letters, if you read the correspondence going back and forth between the ARF leadership, this is what they're trying to do. Based on the, the people they were talking to, based on their meetings with CUP leaders, they're trying to figure out, okay, what's in their heads? You know, was this an aberration? Was this a mistake? Or was, is this something a cover for something more sinister? After weighing all these considerations, the ARF Western Bureau decided to make another attempt at continuing cooperation with the CUP. The attempt would be conditional, however, on the government taking action on a number of critical items arising from the Adana massacres. Thus, the Bureau sent the following directive to the executive body in Constantinople, which I'll summarize. Um, it stated in part, the ARF will continue with the same effort and wider scope to work with the Young Turk Party and intelligentsia in defense of the Constitution. And it will gather around that cooperation all supportive elements, Armenian and non-Armenian alike. The ARF, based on this, demands the following of the CUP. One, legal punishment of officials who failed in their duties and of the leaders of the carnage and corporal punishment for the masses who were responsible. Two, to return or compensate Armenians for their financial losses. Three, secure an annuity for widows or relatives of the dead. A couple other, and then finally, to reorganize the gendarmerie and establish security forces composed of all nationalities, where, of course, before, gendarmes and police had to all be Muslim. On this basis, the ARF does not end its cooperation with the CUP. This is what the uh, Western Bureau sent to the CUP Central Committee. The CUP, in response, took great pains to reassure the ARF of their sincerity and of their support of reforms. They had to demonstrate, they had an onus on themselves to demonstrate that Adana had been only an aberration and that they could ensure the security of the Armenian community. Because, in fact, during the first couple years outside of the Adana massacres, for the first couple years that the, uh, after the constitutional regime was established, security actually got much better there was a huge reduction in the amounts of attacks on Armenians, particularly in the eastern province. Not through any real overt action, but, well, how is it, a, a form of deterrence. Essentially, the, those Kurdish tribes that had conducted most of the attacks, those Turks who, who felt an impunity that they could do whatever they wanted to a Christian, and particularly an Armenian, because he was lesser in the, in the eyes of the government or in the eyes of the courts, they felt they could do whatever they wanted. Once the Constitution officially stated that all Ottoman citizens are equal, whatever their nationality, whatever their religion, that eliminated that sense of impunity. And for at least a year and a half, there was significant reduction, if we put aside Adana, of massacres, of robberies, of rapes, of all the things that the Armenians had become, had unfortunately become accustomed to in the prior years. So there actually had been an improvement of security which other not being the obvious exception to. So, just having a constitution, because people believe maybe the, maybe the CUP really means this, this thing of everyone being equal, it had stopped quite a bit. The question is, did they really mean it? Not only were the Armenians looking at that, but the Kurds and the Turks and everyone else were looking for that as well. So the CUP had to demonstrate that Adana was just an aberration, that they would secure the Armenian community, and thus the ARF and the CUP met in Salonika, to draw up an accord between the two parties so they could, quote, work hand in hand to save Turkey from new disasters, unquote. The terms of this accord committed the two parties to preserve the empire, an increased devolution of power to the provinces, and for them to defend the constitution against all the reactionary movements. And this was issued and publicly, uh, publicly published signed by the ARF Constantinople Responsible Body and by the CUP uh, General Headquarters. So the ARF took a, uh, agreed this agreement to continue cooperation was a serious political gamble by the ARF. They faced serious opposition within the Armenian community, both from their political opponents, who would oppose cooperation with the CUP from the start, and from those whose faith had been broken by the events in Adana. The credibility that the ARF had gained through years of self-defense actions and political education and organizing activities would be lost if the CUP did not deliver on the promises they'd been making. But such was the belief of the, in the, of the ARF leadership in the benefits of constitutionalism that they were willing to give it another try. 
At the same time, you know, we can't rule out a degree of self-interest in this decision. Having already faced stiff criticism, the Arab leadership may not have wanted to admit that their policy of cooperation was a failure unless absolutely necessary. Given that they had invested some seven years in cooperation, dating back to the first op or organized opposition to the Sultan, there would certainly be a certain amount of institutional inertia to overcome to reverse this policy. But there would no longer be an endless supply of patience or goodwill, not after Adana. There would be a heightened level of distrust by the party ranks, and power struggles within the CUP would have to be monitored closely to determine which group held the upper hand. Adana was seen as an example of the danger that faced the Armenians should the Turkish nationalist current overcome the Ottomanist constitutional current within the party. The CUP's room to maneuver was thus seriously circumscribed. If the CUP were unable to deliver promptly on its promises due to the serious institutional and political obstacles, the ARF would be unable to give much slack before they would break off relations. So this is the situation coming out of Adana. So what were ARF-CUP relations? For the first 18 months after the Constitutional Revolution, the Western Bureau's relations with the CUP were irregular due to the internal problems within the CUP. Uh, the relationship, the communication became more regular when, in the beginning of 1910, they established a joint body, which was composed of three RF members and three CUP members. This joint body agreed on the establishment of joint committees to conduct the administrative affairs of three provinces. The CUP pledged to send special inspectors, two of three of whom would be established in the Erzerum, while traveling to the towns and villages of the province, and that would be the pattern for these three provinces. But while the parties were working, there was concern not only over the weakening of the CUP, but especially if, the, as we said, the progressive elements were losing control. The ARF was well aware of the views of the more chauvinist elements within the party and the fact that they were struggling to try to get a majority on the central committee of the CUP. A critical component of the relations between the parties was correcting the many false reports and rumors that were circulating across the country. The reactionary movements may have been initiated many of these rumors, but in any case they had to be responded to promptly to avoid doubts or strains in this Armenian-Turkish relationship. In order to foster support of the constitution and of the constitutional regime, it was also important, they are felt, to send field workers into the provinces to extol the virtues of constitutional regime and to counsel patients in the pace of improvements. Not something we're unfamiliar with people saying today in those past, what, it's been, what, one year and two days. Uh, we keep hearing we have to be patient for change. From the beginning, the ARF stressed the need for joint ARF-CUP delegations, as they would demonstrate to Turks and Armenians that the Constitution would not benefit any one ethnic group to the exclusion of others. The Western Bureau felt obliged to take action, though, as for more than a year their numerous protests and demands had remained unanswered, and the conditions of the provinces, which as I said had been getting better, had started to worsen again. So in March of 1910, they sent two of their members to Salonika to meet with the CUP Central Committee members. The most important subjects were the lands issue, uh, which I'll explain in detail in a moment, and the, the security of Armenians, uh, funding for, for Armenian education, and the harassment of ARF members in certain locations. The CUP emphasized that they had no policy of trying to assimilate the Armenians, and that they knew the Armenians had stood by the Constitution and had loyally supported it. The Bureau deemed the results of this Salonika meeting to have been satisfactory, and five workable points were agreed upon, including, number one, resolving the lands issue in an administrative fashion. In July of 1910, the Western Bureau reported their relationship with the CUP had become closer and friendlier. The unrest in the interior had brought home to the CUP the need to have the backing of a trustworthy organization like the ARF. Also, the appointment of Talat and Javid Bey's to the 
got the cabinet create a steadier channel for communication and improve relations between the parties because in fact when the CUP first came to power none of their act members were actually part of the government they tried to run things from behind the scenes while putting the you know the more traditional leaders up front now they actually start directly taking a hand in the government yet despite yet when the ARF would report later on on its two years of relations with the CUP the Western Bureau would have to report that despite its best efforts, the joint body meetings really had not been convened regularly, and from its formation to the middle of 1911, they only had 16 meetings. That's obviously a problem. So this is how ARF's CUP relations worked for a while, and the, the most important issue that were brought up throughout this was the issue of land restitution and land reform. And to explain this, of course, we need a little bit of background. As peasants comprise the overwhelming majority of the Armenian population, the ARF and the Armenian community's most critical demand of the CUP was land. The restoration of the Constitution raised hopes among the Armenians for the restitution of lands to the dispossessed, and that this, together with their promised equal status as Ottoman citizens, would allow the economic survival of the Armenian population in the historically Armenian regions. Land dispossession, economic deprivation, abuses by Kurdish tribes, and official indifference or complicity during prior decades had resulted in large-scale migrations of Armenians. This westward movement, within the empire or overseas, was hastened by and, hastened by and combined with Abdul Hamid's massacres of 1894 to 1896, realized the government's goal of reducing the Armenian majorities or pluralities in the eastern vilayets and parts, and parts of Giligia. Abdul Hamid realized that Armenian appeals for European intervention on behalf for improved rights and conditions would be weakened if there was a decrease in the Armenian percentage of the population. And the ARF too was acutely aware of the political impact of these demographic changes. Historian Anhi Derminasian notes, for several years they had witnessed with concern the decline of the Armenian population, particularly in the eastern vilayets, where wars, massacres, famines, a rural exodus, and the installation of muhajirs favored regional Islamization. Muhajirs being Muslims often from the Balkans who were resettled intentionally in Armenian uh, villages or near Armenian villages. The utterly hopeless position of the dispossessed under the Sultan played no small part in this ecstatic reaction they had to the constitutional revolution. The promise of equal status as citizens was interpreted to mean that past injustices would be remedied in the form of stolen lands being restored to their rightful owners. Given the rhetoric of the constitutional movement and the critical role that unequal status played in these dispossessions, this was not an illogical conclusion. In fact, this prospect of equal status was so appealing that many of those who had fled the, the countryside to the cities or abroad now returned. This caused more you know, uh, land ownership disputes. Initially, the CUP showed a determination to redistribute land and to improve conditions for all peasants, not just Armenians. From their days in the political underground, they were well aware of the role that, that rural conditions had played in the discontent with the Sultan's government and in allowing European interventions. The CUP and the ARF agreed that the best, if not only, method to settle these disputes was through a joint Armenian-Turkish commission. After the counter-revolution, though, uh, either due to a loss of self-confidence or their unwillingness to expend political capital on an issue that predominantly benefited Armenians, the CUP would retreat from this joint commission idea. Now, the, the the, Tur the Kurdish and Turkish deputies from in the parliament from the eastern provinces and the Aghas and large landowners whose interests they represented were the most significant obstacle to land reform. For while the constitution had brought parliamentary representation to minorities who had been largely powerless before, they had also brought these landed, these powerful interests, a direct voice in the government where bef you know, that they had, didn't have before. So the there's pluses and minuses to democracy, too. Now, while Talat and others counseled patience and pointed out the obstacles that they had to overcome, they did not waver from their pledges that they'd made in earlier discussions. 
They realized the political cost of a rupture with the ARF and that resolution of the lands issue was a critical article of good faith. And the ARF too was not unrealistic how fast reforms could be instituted. While they considered to pursue it, they realized there were, made, there were significant obstacles and that the, the CUP was not on entirely firm footing. But the government repeatedly postponed resolution of the lands issue. Talat, who by then was Minister of the Interior, would not take a decisive step, the ARF said in their reports, regarding the issue, either because he chose not to or felt he could not. And the failure to allow an administrative redress for Armenians dispossessed under the Sultan was a critical issue to the ARF, because they were certain it would take years to reform the Ottoman judiciary, where a, a, a Muslim testifying and a Christian testifying were not considered equal in, in the eyes of the court, and thus they had to do it, the government had to do it administratively, it would not be possible to take these issues to court. Despite that second mission to Salonika in 1911 that I mentioned earlier, and CUP's repeated agreement to ARF demands on land reform, it soon became clear that there would be no substantial pro progress in rectifying land disputes and dispositions in the near future. While the Western Bureau realized and recognized that the political and bureaucratic obstacles faced the CUP meant that rapid reform was unrealistic, the almost total lack of progress was a serious disappointment. The failure to resolve the lands issue and the eventual realization that the CUP was not acting in good faith in this matter would prove to be a crippling blow to ARF-CUP cooperation. Given their investment in the issue and the fundamental role it played in any determination of the extent of justice and equal status for Armenians under the Constitution, it would be a decisive factor in the decision in 1912 to break off relations and for the ARF to go into political opposition. While they could accept delays in implementation, abandonment of land restitution, they could not accept. And even uh, Gerald Fitzmaurice, the first secretary of the British Embassy, summed up in 1913 the centrality of the lands issue to Armino-Turkish relations. Uh, he stated, this failure to settle the usurped lands question has been interpreted by the Armenians as evidence of bad faith on the part of the committee and of their secret intention to persist in the old methods of breaking up the peasantry. Thus, as this goes on, as the land reform turns out not, turns out not to be happening, as you might expect, relations between the ARF and the CUP would in fact deteriorate. Uh, despite the repeatedly sending uh, members like Varamian and Sharigyan to meet with the CUP Central Committee in Salonika, the fact they'd always come to agreement, the CUP never seemed to deliver, the, or the government never seemed to deliver on the promises, not just on land reform, but specifically on security. So when they met in 1911, the Bureau decided to postpone all other issues and concentrate solely on the lands issue and on the security issues. There, the CUP agreed to take steps to control persecution by having the government arm all villages, Armenian and Kurdish alike. This was because, obviously, the, 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 to protect these villages from nomadic Kurds who had been receiving arms from the government for some time. So it wasn't just Armenian villages that needed protection. Kurdish settled Kurds need protection from the nomadic Kurds as well. And so the agreement was to start arming the, the villagers. The ARF Sixth World Congress, in the midst of all this, would convene in the summer of 1911. After seeing everything that happened, analyzing both the lands issue and the security issue, the main agenda item, as you might expect, was the question of cooperation with the CUP. The meeting evaluated the cooperation agreement that had been signed and said that was probably the best agreement you could have, uh, and they agreed on the list of demands the Western Bureau had presented to the CUP. <clears throat> But despite ratifying the past actions regarding cooperation, the meeting was extremely critical of the CUP's duplicity and failure to live up to its promises. After evaluating the prospects and dangers of continued cooperation, the World Congress passed a resolution that stated, we note with sorrow, despite a series of hopeful initiatives, in the three years of constitutional rule, the government's policies have not only haven't created a improved life, for and reconciliation between peoples of all religions and races, 
but they have generally given way to distrust between peoples and denial of national rights. The CUP has gradually withdrawn from constitutional and democratic principles. The CUP has failed to take steps to combat and cleanse itself of right-wing elements, which have developed a preponderant influence. And also that the despots, ravishers, and corrupt elements have been left unpunishment, unpunished and have continued the looting, massacres, and the marauding. Therefore, the World Congress decides if, after the party's appeal, the CUP and the cabinets drawn from it do not show through their deeds that the realization of their repeated promises are imminent, the Western Bureau is authorized to cease its relations with the CUP. Essentially, turning the, the, the demands into a requirement meet these demands or the Western Bureau should break off relations. Now, we can't look at these strictly in a vacuum and say, well, the CUP just didn't want to do it. The CUP itself was in a pretty weak political position. Um, they were having, I mean, from the first day they came to power, in fact, within days of, the, of their revolution, as you know, Austria-Hungary occupied and next Bosnia Herzegovina, one part of its empire. Bit by bit throughout, you know, the Italians would invade Libya in 1911. They would be repre they would have uprising in Albania, in Macedonia, in Yemen. And so politically they are weakening throughout this period. And as this happens, new political parties are arising to oppose the CUP, which is going to make it more difficult for them to take action on the Armenian demands. Now, what the Bureau believed is there was a crisis in the Parliament where the two wings of the CUP were, in fact, fighting each other. Their sympathies were with the minority wing that was in charge of the government and was more European-minded and more progressive. The others were more conservative, more old-fashioned. The ARF tried to closely monitor factional infighting in hopes that, and as its hopes for reform and constitutionalism obviously laid with the progressives. They knew there was little hope for any national rights if the traditionalists were to come back to power. The particular concern they had is that the main reason, the way the, the CUP had come to power, and in fact the main way they were staying in power, was not through having superior numbers, but was through the military. It was very much, and they, they evaluated as a double-edged sword. I mean, they can live by it, you can die by it. They're held in power by the military, which, but that also meant if they're trying to reform, they would be unable to reform the military, and they would be unable to take any steps that the military opposed. So the CUP was in a weak position, and this would also contribute to the eventual breaking off of relations, which would come in 1912. Now, in early 1912, we see the, an immediate test of ARF-CUP cooperation on top of all the others we've already talked about in the form of new parliamentary elections. Now, where they worked together well in the prior elections and had a substantial Armenian uh, uh, members of parliament, the CUP felt that the CUP started adding members to the, uh, to their, to the, to the cabinet and coming into some real disagreements with the, uh, with the ARF on how many Armenian deputies would be allowed. Um, the agreement was that Armenian candidates would be put forward in all locations where the Armenian population was a significant percentage. But the definition of the percentage, as even today, is, is always in dispute. How many Armenians are there really? Um, so the negotiations initially start saying, okay, there'll be 13 Armenian deputies, and they agreed on which places, and then we'll negotiate about maybe another 10 more. But as things go on, as the local uh, committees put their elections together, it's seen, even though the central CUP might agree to a, a large number of Armenians, the local committees were reneging on the promises of Armenian representation, including places like Erzinjan, Diyarbakir, Kharpert, and Marash, um, and Trebizon, in addition to Trebizon. Uh, the CUP in Erzurum, which the ARF in Erzurum, the ARF Eastern Bureau kept trying to meet with in order to resolve these issues, kept postponing any meetings. And while this was happening, more and more Armenian seats, or seats that the ARF expected to go to the Armenians, were going to others instead. So the Western Bureau's relations with the CUP deteriorated greatly as these electoral machinations continued. 
The Bureau had concentrated on reaching the agreement on improvement in conditions for the Armenians before they even, you know, negotiated specifically on how many members of parliament because they thought that was more important. But the behavior of the CUP in the elections caused serious discontent among the Armenian public and in the ARF ranks. And even more important, the, had, the, uh, they, they had not complied with almost any of the demands that had been in the accord they had signed with the ARF just two and a half months before the election. The Western Bureau reported that the deception by the CUP was beyond belief and issued an ultimatum to the CUP that would give a final chance comply with this ultimatum or we're no longer in cooperation with you, we are, we are going to have to go into the political opposition, including establishing a committee to implement the accord they'd agreed to, creating Armenian and Kurdish village guards in Van and Bitlis Vilayets, uh, ensuring the right of return with a government subsidy for Armenian refugees, Armenian gendarmes, and the like. If the CUP failed to order these administrative changes within 15 days, and did not address the other nine points, the ARF would, would end their relationship consistent with the decision of the Sixth World Congress. While this is happening, while in fact these 15 days are going on, in July of 1912, the parliament, the, uh, the, cap, the new cabinet that the CUP was supporting was a bigger number of, won a, a vote of confidence in the parliament by a vote of 194 to 4. Overwhelming, right? Two days later, the cabinet fell, which sound, doesn't sound right. Uh, and the Bureau, in fact, saw the fall of the cabinet as indicative of how this Ottoman revolutionary regime operated. A group could keep the reins of power in their hands for four years because they had the support of the Army Officer Corps. Then all you had to have is one general, Nazim Pasha, uh, form a Praetorian Guard, he called the League of Savior Officers, to manipulate the the political system and suddenly the cabinet's gone. That's all it took to drop the government and that, if nothing else, convinced the ARF that the, the, the CUP is, is not really going to be, is not really a, a, a is going to be a force for, for, for change. The Western Bureau, though, saw they were in a no-win situation. Despite all the deceptions and manipulations, the CUP was still, they felt, the only Turkish party the ARF could negotiate with because they were a lesser evil than their opponents. And so for that reason, they stopped their press criticism of the CUP, but in the second week of August, announced in their newspapers Azad Ahmad in Constantinople and Haraj in Erzurum that they had broken off relations with the CUP, and would, but, but would maintain a position of neutrality during the conflict between the Turkish par parties in Parliament. Thus, unlike what we'd heard from I explained earlier in the Turkish historiography that as soon as the first Balkan war broke out, the ARF took advantage to break off, the decision was made, there was no war yet. I mean, it clearly happened and was announced in the press months earlier. Well, excuse me, well, let me make it weeks earlier. Um, because in fact, at the end of September, almost, almost two months, the Balkan states and the Ottoman Empire began mobilization of their armed forces. On October 8th, Montenegro would declare war on the Ottoman Empire and the First Balkan War began. So, the war and the party's break with the CUP, in fact, would increase the danger to the Armenian population. ARF realized this, thus Rostom and Sapastatsi Murad would go to Constantinople to meet with Simon Zavarian, their only agenda item being how to arm the, uh, themselves and protect the Armenian people. In the course of this meeting, they determined that they had to reestablish the self-defense structure that they had had before 1908, but that it would take years, money, resources, and leadership, none of which was currently available. By October, the ARF saw the Ottomans were being soundly beaten in the war and expected that there would be a peace conference at which the Europeans would divide the spoils of war. But this would also provide an opportunity to obtain the essential reforms needed to guarantee security and a livelihood to the Armenian population of Eastern Anatolia. Not only would, did the negotiations provide an opportunity for discussion of reforms for the Armenian provinces, but the war had also created political pressure that would force the Ottoman government to address the issue where the, they would, didn't have to before. There were two schools of thought within the ARF of how to obtain these reforms. The first school believed nothing is given to beggars. 
that in fact the lack of an Armenian liberation movement had cost the Armenians back in 1878 at the Congress of Berlin, where, as we know, all the Balkan countries got independence and the Armenians had their uh, paper shed up, as we all know from Khrimian uh, Heidegg's Yergate Shed Up speech, sermon. Therefore, in this, in this school's view, they had to start a liberation movement again and initiate separatist activity in order to have their demands for reform taken seriously. The second school of thought within the party thought that a liberation movement would be harmful to the Armenian people under the existing circumstances. This view, in fact, carried the majority in the party meetings, and therefore the party took a wait-and-see approach within the empire in order to avoid massacres. Again, no rebellion is starting during the Balkan War. They made an explicit decision not to do that. So, the major preoccupation of the ARF and the Armenian community during 1913 was the ongoing negotiations, the peace negotiations, between the Europeans and the Ottoman governments. And so, as this, these are going on, the Russian government was take, doing everything in its power to take a leading role over the Armenian reform question, which had become part of these overall negotiations. In January of 1913, however, the CUP conducted a coup d'etat, because in fact they had fallen out of power briefly, and with the collaboration of army officers uh, who were CUP members or had just opposed ending the war, they overthrow that cabinet that had taken over back when Said, uh, Said, Said Halim's uh, cabinet had fallen. But as the CUP has a coup, as you might expect, the Balkan countries say, oh look, they're having a coup, here's our chance. The Balkan countries started the war again, and the second Balkan war in fact starts. And with the resumption of hostilities, the Ottomans soon face a continuing series of defeats. So they're back at war. Um, there would be months of negotiations over the issue of what to do with the Armenian provinces. Uh, the key sticking point that would cause this to drag on for months and months would be the plan that, the, that, that was being pushed by the Armenians and by the Europeans, that to have European inspectors general to oversee the Armenian provinces. This is called the control issue. Rather than having a Ottoman governor, there would be a European governor who would oversee the particular Armenian provinces in order to give the Armenians some chance of redress. The ARF and the Patriarchate would pay a key role in formulating the Armenian demands that were being presented to the powers throughout these negotiations. In September of 1913, Russia and Germany would finally agree to divide the Armenian provinces into two sectors, each with its own European Inspector General. In, a in Europe, the ARF briefed the inspectors that were eventually appointed after months of arguing, do we want a Dane, do we want a, a Dutchman, do we want Belgian, it we went on and on. But between those debates and the fact that uh, the Ottomans, with the assistance directly of the Germans, had repeatedly delayed this agreement for over a year, and after that delayed its implementation, these inspectors who were finally appointed would not depart Constantinople, or depart for Constantinople, until May of 1914. Obviously, it'll, it'll be too late with the coming of World War I. So, although there was potential in these reform negotiations, that finally they would actually have direct European oversight of how the Ottomans were actually governing the Armenian provinces, because of the coming of World War I and because the Ottomans and the Germans were so successful in delaying this, we never actually got to see uh, if this would work. Only one of the two inspectors even reached his post before the war began. I have two last things we'll cover, um, two last critical items, and then we'll, I'll you know, take your questions on, on anything that, uh, any questions that might have arisen. Um, one of the key questions is the issue of self-defense. Uh, it's it's been stated well you know the, one of the reasons and one you know one of the reasons for the Armenian genocide is that the the, 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 the Armenians disarm themselves they disband the Fedais and the ARF disband the Fedais and therefore the Armenians were unprotected when the genocide came um, so one of the items I looked at is what we start this uh, is what I mentioned a little earlier that as soon as they broke off relations with the CUP they realized we've got to do something we've got to start rearming we've got to reform this. And the worsening situation in the provinces and the dim prospects that cooperation with the CUP would ever be reestablished create an urgent need to purchase arms for self-defense. 
In February of 1913, Varanchan reported the party was putting all its attention on the issue of self-defense and raising the funds necessary to buy armaments, which were very expensive. Conditions had prevented, had prevented fundraising the caucuses in prior years, and thus the party was already in financial difficulties before these added de demands. The ARF came to the realization that the only way to prevent the annihilation of the Armenian population was by reforming the Fedites. The means for self-defense, however, were lacking. The most recent series of searches and seizures was essentially an effort to disarm not just the Fedais, but all the Armenian villagers who they had, in prior years, tried to give arms to. Varamyan was sent to the Caucasus to collect funds to buy arms. However, the bourgeoisie refused to contribute. Only the students and workers had given him some 3,000 rubles with which to buy guns. In Egypt, the Armenian community disputed the need for self-defense activities, invoking the name of Boros Nubar Pasha to buttress their case. So, Varantian was sent to meet to, straight to the horse's mouth to meet with Boros Nubar, and they had a, he had a series of meetings, and uh, Nubar expressed his high regard towards the ARF. His only fear was that uh, pressuring, um, he feared that pressuring wealthy Armenians for funds and importing weapons would attract negative attention from the government, uh, particularly because he was ongoing diplomat, he was due, had ongoing diplomatic negotiations with the Europeans. But he stated, if the negotiations failed, quote, I will put all my skills into the revolutionary effort, unquote. Varantian informed Boris Nubar that the bourgeoisie was not contributing towards the self-defense fundraising. Nubar said they were acting like Jesuits. Uh, interesting for me, having gone to BC, but that was his, uh, I guess that's his term for somebody being cheap. He said they didn't want to contribute, and they were therefore using, quote, his name and his statement, unquote, as an excuse not to have to shell out any money. He agreed to send letters to Egypt and to Bulgaria, explaining that he was not opposed to arming the people for their self-defense. He was only concerned that distributing arms could lead to a premature uprising. Varatyan trusted that Nubar would follow through on his promises and urged that he be taken at his word. Thus we arrive in the summer of 1914 to the ARF 8th World Congress and the approach of war. The ARF World Congress was held in Erzerum in Jul uh, late July of 1914. It was adjourned early because of the start of the war in Europe. A committee of nine was formed to stay behind to complete certain essential tasks. While this committee was meeting, Dr. Behajin Shakir and Naji Bey arrived as representatives of the CUP and of the Ottoman government. They met for three days with Rostom, with Agnuni, and Varamya. After lengthy discussions, the CUP representatives disclosed that the government had decided to take advantage of what they hoped would be a German defeat of France and of Russia to take care of their own unfinished business, meaning uh, removing Turkish inhabited lands from Ser the Serbian rule, recovering the Dodecanese islands, canceling the capitulation, and basically coming back to being a great empire again. <clears throat> Further, they stated, should the Russians be completely defeated, they would advance into the Caucasus either to conquer or to incite a revolution. According to Shakir and Naji, the Georgians and the Tatars in the Caucasus were already preparing for a rebellion against Russian rule. However, the Armenians, they felt, were the keys to success because they believed the ARF had the power to and ability to persuade the Russian Armenians to remain loyal to the Russian government until a critical juncture, at which time they would shift their allegiance to the Turks. Funny, isn't that what... The Turks say the Armenians were doing in the Ottoman Empire? Well, guess what? That's what they wanted the Armenians, and in particular the ARF, to do within the Russian Empire. They assured the ARF that the Ottoman gov government had no interest in occupying the Caucasus, but merely wanted to pull it out of Russia's orbit and to give it autonomy. Mm -hmm. That and 50 cents will get you the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, the ARF representatives responded that the Russian Armenians no longer had the enthusiasm for Ottoman constitutional rule that they had from 1908 to 1910. The errors made by the government and the CUP in regards to the Ottoman Ar Armenians would give Russian Armenians no confidence that support for the Ottoman government would improve conditions for their compatriots across the border. Before promising autonomy to the Armenians in the Caucasus, 
the government should hurry and implement policies that would win over the Ottoman Armenians. This, as you might expect, went over with like a lead balloon with the CUP reps, but basically the ARF said the Armenians in the Russian Empire will do their duty and join the Russian armies. The Armenians in the Ottoman Empire will do their duties as citizens and join the Ottoman armies. And there will be no uh, fifth column. In Constantinople, Talat expressed his disappointment in the party stance to the ARF parliamentarian Armen Garo. The Bureau called a consultative meeting with its key members, as well as with Krikor Zorab, who was a key member of the, uh, the Ar Armenian caucus in the parliament. The meeting was divided between those who expected a speedy Russian victory over the Ottoman armies, and those who feared a lengthy campaign which would be fought largely on Ottoman, uh, excuse me, Armenian populated lands. In either case, volunteer units had to be ready to defend the Armenian population if massacres began, while somehow not appearing to be a fifth column, and thus provide a pretext for such massacres. This was the tightrope the ARF, and in fact the entire Armenian community, had to walk as the guns of war approached, and World War I broke out. Thank you. I trust there are some questions. Sure. Dick Ronald, could you give us some history on the ARF? Repeat the question. When it was founded, what the power base is? When you say the World Congress, how many countries was it represented in? And what was the power base uh, for the ARF representing the Army? Sure. Um, the question is, uh, giving a little background on the ARF on its power base. I mean. The ARF was founded in Tiflis in 1890. Uh, as I stated, the Rostom, Simon Zavaria, and Krispor Mikhailin was a third of the, of the founders. It initially uh, drew, it, it largely drew from Russian Armenian intelligentsia, but uh, would immediately spread into the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Armenian provinces as well. Um, Power, uh, where did George power from? Uh, largely, as, as I referred to, it was through the FEDAI units. From the period of, say, 1902 to 1907, the biggest part of their activities was, in fact, smuggling arms from Iran and from the Russian Empire into the Ottoman Empire, both to support FEDAI groups who would defend the arms and, but, and to actually arm the villagers themselves in order to give them a means to protect themselves because by law at that time, Armenians were not allowed to be armed. And so this was actually how the ARF built up. I mean, you talk about its power base, its support largely came from that. The fact that they were actually seen as defending the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. In the Russian Empire, the ARF got most of its um, credibility um, when, uh, was it 1905, the Tsar decided to nationalize Armenian church lands that, you know, the, all land, you know, there should be no church lands, they should all belong to the Russian state. The ARF basically started a, 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 a program of passive and then later more active resistance that forced the Tsar to back down, and this, of course, gave huge credibility to the ARF that they had protected the Armenian church and protected their lands. So, it was, its greatest support was among villagers, among, uh, you know, it was not, it was not among the, the, the upper classes. Uh, Constantinople, in fact, it was probably one of its weaker spots where they, the ARF would in fact run into conflicts, one with the Amiras, the, the, rich, um, the rich bankers and others in Constantinople, and they also had their conflicts with a lot of the, um, with the not with the parish priests, but with the upper echelons of the Armenian church because they were considered uh, too conservative. And in fact, there would be many, uh, before the period I'm talking about, there were a number of clashes between the, uh, the church and both the Hinchagyan and uh, Tashnag uh, political parties because uh, they, were, you know, they, they were seen as causing too much trouble uh, for, for the Armenians. And there were cases, in fact, where the, a bishop would, in fact, report the uh, report to the Ottoman government that all oh, look, look out the Hunchugs are doing this and the Ottoman army would come down and crack down on them. Uh, yeah. By the, in the period that you're speaking of, had the Ottoman Empire lost all its European countries? Good question. Um, the, they not lost all of them. When they first came to power in 1908, Austria-Hungary annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
during the First Balkan War that I spoke of, that is when they lost most of their European powers. Basically, the First Balkan War that I mentioned was all the Balkan countries getting together and attacking uh, their former overlords in the Ottoman Empire and basically beating them badly in the First War. That caused them to lose huge chunks, almost all of their Ottoman provinces. The Second Balkan War, however, although it first started off badly for the Ottomans, in the end, the, uh, the Balkan countries started fighting amongst each other, and the, Turks act the Ottomans actually won back a fair amount of their, of their Balkan territories uh, due, uh, from that. But they still lost a major chunk of Bulgaria, most of Romania, uh, you know, further parts of Macedonia. So they did have some, it's actually in this period that they end up losing their biggest chunk of their European uh, territories. The other question is, did the Rungavars exist at this time? They did. They did, but were, they were not a major factor in within the within the uh, either the Ottoman Parliament or in most of these activities. They were they were players. They did they were they were uh, involved. Their numbers were still fairly small. The Rungavars' biggest power was actually outside of the Ottoman Empire in places like Europe and in Egypt. Okay. Yep. I've got uh, long negotiations between the CUP and, and the and the ARF. What role, if any, did Shah Natali play? Repeat the question. Uh, the question is, what role did Shah Natali play in the negotiation between the ARF and the CUP? I did not find him. Uh, I did not end up finding any uh, mention of Shah Natali. I think I don't think he was in the Ottoman Empire at that time. Uh, uh, he might have already been in the United States at that point. So I, I, you know, I don't recall seeing anything in the documents I looked at that he was directly involved. Uh, he, of course, would become Shah Natali. For those who don't know, would become very important after World War One, where he would be the uh, or, one of the main organizers of Operation Nemesis, which was the assassination of the perpetrators of the Armenian genocide, like Tevilian's assassination of Talat and the others. Yep. Um, you covered it sporadically, but can you briefly concentrate on the divisions within the Armenian ranks? That's right. The higher uh, high-ranking clergy, the, the higher class, and the two revolutionary Armenian parties, Tashak Tushun and Hunchak, uh, during these negotiations, not exactly mm -hmm. their ideology, or during these negotiations, are they together, are they fighting each other and negotiating with the CUP? That, that's a very good question. Um, most of the clashes I was speaking of took place before the Ottoman Constitution. During this period, naturally, I mean, we know Armenians, we don't get along. Uh, you know, we're going to argue, you know, two Armenians, three opinions, and four churches, right? Um, but there actually was a fair amount, there, there was largely cooperation. I mean, they would always clash, you know. They're, they're fighting over who gets, you know, which party gets to have the parliamentary seat from Erzegum or for wherever else. So they're obviously going to be that. But there were a number of means that the Armenians actually generally worked together pretty well during this period. Um, when it came time to make a demand, you know, to, to form things, there were two main uh, means through which they did. One was the Armenian National Assembly, uh, which uh, was uh, representatives of all the of of all the Armenian of the, the church and all the Armenian communities. The only disadvantage there with the Armenian National Assembly is that it just gave disproportionate power to uh, people from Constantinople and much less to the, to the people of the provinces, which of course outnumbered them ten or twenty to one. Um, so they worked together with the Armenian Assem National Assembly, and I, you know, I, re I read in the documents of some clashes, but of course, in the end, when it came time to make a presentation, uh, they'd have their fights, they'd do their backroom deals, they'd do their fighting, and in the end, they'd present to the Patriarch, who, who was, if, you know, and the ARF and the Patriarch would, would finally come to agreement, and they'd make one presentation on behalf of the entire Armenian community. Um, so, yep. Similarly, sorry. Uh, from what I know briefly, there, there was much more differences between Eastern Armenians together within the, the parties and the religious class and the Western Armenians at that time. Each one of their concerns becoming a primary uh, focus of the mm -hmm. Armenian movement. And they were uh, competing uh, kind of... I can't disagree. That there, there, there were significant differences. You find that in the debates between the Eastern and Western bureaus. Uh, in part, it's because the Western bureaus in Constantinople, the Eastern bureaus in Erzurum, and they're actually seeing up close what's happening. Uh, so there was different approaches. The interesting thing is, and this which you might not expect, 
it was usually the Western Bureau that said, I can't stand the CUP, let's get rid of them. And it was the Eastern Bureau saying, no, no, be more patient. You wouldn't expect that. But that, so you do see that within the documents to a great deal, but it's not, not what you might expect. You'd expect, you know, the Russian, the, the, the more Russianized, the more revolutionary Eastern Bureau to be one demanding much more. It ended up being the opposite. Maybe because the, the, the Western Bureau actually had to deal with the CUP people from day to day. Uh, as you explored these documents, uh, two questions. One, what did you find that was surprising to you? And second, did you find anything that, as you went through this, you said, I wish they hadn't done this, about what the ARF did? Yeah. Good question. Um, well, I, the, well I, if I had to pick one, it was the... Um, the bourgeoisie or Jesuits line. I mean that. I mean, you know, one that the ARF was, you know, on that kind of good terms with Boris Nubad Pasha, and that he was that frank in, in, in analyzing it. That was, that. I mean, if you want to just pinpoint one item. Beside that, what else? Um, I would say it was the extent of the debates within the ARF. The fact that you know, on every one of these issues, it you know, huge debates. I mean. On the very issue of even cooperating with the with the CUP, Antonik, General Antonik, left the party over it. He, you know, when, when the Balkan War, you know, when he, you know, during the Balkan Wars, you might know he was organizing uh, 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 units to join to help to help fight with the with the Balkan countries. So the, the the fights within the ARF, although you know, in the end, they come to the majority decision. The minority, in most cases, you know, stayed in. That was actually probably the most interesting, just the fact that there could be such differing uh, uh, ideas within uh, in the party. Uh, as far as the one thing I wish they didn't do, you had to put me on the spot on that one. Um, possible things, I mean, the one thing might be, why did they, or the one question that gets raised in my mind is why did they w hold on so long? Why did they keep, you know, you understand, okay, Adana came up, it was less, they were in power less than a year, you could understand them continuing cooperation. The question is, you know, how, how many chances were they going to give them? And, and the, so that, that's the one question, and it's, and it's a legitimate question, although you can see the reasons why. I mean, the alternative was so horrible. I mean, you know, yeah, okay, the, 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 the CUP refuses to deliver on anything, but look who's, look who's ready to take power on the other side is, uh, you know, even more people who can't stand Armenians at all and are ready, you know, won't even give us the lip services saying, yeah, we're going to try to help you. Um, so that would, that would be the only thing I would say, you know, and again, is, you know, should they have waited that long? I guess that's the one question that ends up coming into my mind on it. Yep. With the uh, ARF archives, because Turkey always uses it as an excuse that we open our archives, but the one in Boston doesn't mm -hmm. open it for us to kind of get it. Can you? Again, repeat the question. Yeah. And can we go there right now and look around? <laughs> I can't go there and look around. Uh, the question is, what's the story with the ARF archives and at the Haydnik and, the, and they're being open and the fact that it's used by the Turkish government? Well, first of all, the Turkish archives aren't open. As Professor Akjam can tell you, certain parts of the Turkish archives are open, uh, but there are many important things that are not open. Secondly, you're comparing apples and oranges, which you know, the Turkish government likes to do. A Turkish the government has millions of dollars to spend on preparing an archive and had 80 years in order to clean up anything they didn't want to see in it. Uh, the ARF archive is a private archive, and the, they are currently working on... Um, had on digitizing it. In fact, I met with the director of the ARF Archive Institute just a couple nights ago, and they are working on making it, you know, open for all. But it's going to take quite a while because, I mean, I got permission for a limited period uh, to look at and for a limited period of time myself. Um, and the reason being is that the documents are very fragile. You know, I had to handle the actual documents, and you wouldn't. I mean, some of them are, are literally written on tissue paper. And they've been sitting in a vault, they're under, you know, their humidity controls, whatever else, but they're, they're quite fragile. I mean, you'd be amazed at the kinds of things you'll see. I mean, a postcard, and this is how poor some of these ARF field workers were. They take a postcard, and they write in maybe, I don't know, six-point type would be the equivalent. And they're writing along the edges and all the way around and fitting in every corner because that's the only paper they had to fill. Uh, the largest report on the... Um, the report by the Bureau to the World Congress was written in a 
ch child's uh, composition book that st still had, um, what is it, uh, what's the big uh, department store in France? Uh, Le Ma Paris Marché. Paris Marché. That's, that, that was, it, it's written, that's the cover of this child's composition book. That's what the report was written in. So, I mean, so that, those are some of the obstacles. So, it is going to take some time. They occur, uh, as they digitize it, you know, it, this will hopefully become available to all scholars because it is a very rich resource. But even, I mean, even going beyond that, you know, for a fact, only up to 1924 has even been cataloged. Years after 1924 are still completely uncataloged. That's a whole other job. So the problem is it's a private archive, and it's not a government archive, and whenever the Turkish government raises issues like that, that has to be pointed out. The, first of all, go in the Arme American archives, go in the British archives, go in the French archives, go in the German archives. You can find plenty of evidence of whatever we're saying, first of all. Why don't we answer this back? Why is it that we're never answered this We do, we do, but you don't always hear it, because because we are not a government, you know. The, the, what the, said. She said, "Why don't we answer back?" Well, you know, the, the the Armenian community can raise whatever ruckus. We do not have the same kind of a platform or microphone that the Turkish government has. That's that's the main reason. You do answer back, but not everyone always hears. Yep. Okay. I saw what you said, but I'm a bit Mm -hmm. okay. We, stupid Armenians, sorry to say that the massacre started in the 1800s, 1850s and onwards. Uh, Cyprus was given to the British so that the British would shut up the uh, accusation against the Turks. And we still keep quiet and never answer this to you. The Adana massacre, the Bank Ottoman uh, problems. All this happened before the First World War. And what, what are our leaders and uh, institutions doing? And the, the question is, given everything that happened, all the series of massacres, etc., why didn't the Armenians fight back earlier, despite the fact we were accused now of supposedly being a, 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 a fifth column? Well, part of it is what I explained. Uh, the ARF had done a lot of work before 1907 in arming, in Fed eyes, etc., when they went to actually reform those, they couldn't even get the Armenian community to put up the money to be able to buy the guns. I mean, that's, it's a serious obstacle. I mean, was anyone else out there trying to arm the Armenian people? Not that I'm aware of. So, yeah, oh, is that wasn't the question? Well, my, question yeah. is that, my question is that the Turkish government uh, accuses us that, yeah. we, that we stepped up in the back during the First World War. Right. They deny that there was any massacres or genocide before that. This is my question. And do we, we have got in the history books, we have got in the foreign governments archives that it started 20 years before yes. the... Yes, and, and we and say that. Yeah, okay, we say, but we, we don't say it as it should be, how should I tell you, that's what the world population we know about it. Well, yeah, you're, you're correct. And the reason being is that we as an Armenian community do not have the money to the, the money and the power that the Turkish government has. The Turkish government, you should realize, just to def just the last time the Armenian Genocide Resolution came up, yeah. they spent three million dollars just in one month to stop this Armenian American community, which altogether has what, maybe twenty full-time people working on this issue in the entire United States, between all the organizations put together, they spent three million dollars in one month just to try to stop any discussion of this issue, to hold it down. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of resources. On, you know, when the Armenian government is in a better financial situation and is no longer being squeezed so much by the State Department to, 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 buck, to buckle to Turkish demands, when the Armenian government can join us more freely in, in uh, join the Armenian community in doing that, I think you'll see that change. But until Armenia improves itself, its political position, its economic position, unfortunately Turkey has a, a built-in advantage. Yep. Uh, quick question. Uh, the first one, uh, the correspondence between the the Arab Western Office and Eastern Office was that in Turkish or Armenian? Armenian. And the next question, I'm a bit confused. Well, the, 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 of course, Eastern Armenian to Western Armenian for the most part. Aravela Haidang, you have mega Aravela and Haidang, Musa Aravmela Haidang. And they have no problem, right? 
Um, the, the, the same question, and Adana massacres, uh, so the cop, there was a, a coup d'etat, and a cop came to power because of the army, as you explained, mm -hmm. and right after that, you said there was a reactionary uh, uprising against the cop, and was was there other uh, people besides Armenians were massacred in Adana, or what, what was the... Uh, mm -hmm. What was the underlying cause? Sure. Uh, yeah, the question is the underlying cause of the Adana massacres. What precisely? You know, the, 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 yeah, I, I shortened it for the purpose of this. Uh, of this, what happened is there's a coup in Constantinople. The CUP is thrown out of power. This throws the whole country into disarray. They would actually come to power fairly quickly. An army uh, of CUP loyalists comes, takes over Constantinople. There's a. They take advantage of the situation in Adana. Part of the thing is. There was one particular, uh, the, the Turks, of course, blow this out of proportion, but the, the Armenian bishop in Adana did shoot off his mouth a fair amount when the, 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 the revolution, when the initial constitution came to power. Of course, that's no excuse for what they did, but the, the Turks, who had been so used to the Armenians being under their, their thumb, started feeling, oh, you know, oven, oven you know, how come they're having, you know, they, they had an Easter procession, they never had that before. How are they having plays about the Armenian Empire, oh, they want to retake over. They took, you know, little things, saying, who are these Armenians to get out of their place, so when the opportunity presented themselves, a set of massacres took place. Then, Shevket Pasha's uh, army actually comes, takes Adana over, puts down the rebellion. You figure everything will be okay. However, while he's there, another set of massacres take place. That's the one that's less clear as to, did he turn a blind eye, was the CEP involved, etc. They've taken power back over, and yet there's a whole new set of massacres. But it, you know, it, it's, it's not clear who incited them. But largely, it was members of the population taking advantage of the opportunity, saying, eh, we'll, we'll show these Armenians uh, what, how things really are. Well, the same was other nationalities like uh, other like Greeks or other people were can't repeat it. Yeah, the question is were there other nationalities? I think there were some, but it was almost entirely directed at the Armenians. Although the Greeks, the Jews, everyone else benefited from the constitution, the one that was so obvious of the people who, who celebrated the most and who had the biggest advantage because we were the largest numbers were the Armenians. And in other now there weren't huge numbers of other nationalities. Uh, so, yep. Is there a comparatively Similarly, uh, the 904. <laughs> is there a similarly comprehensive study of ARF-CUP relations from the other side? Ah, good question. Um, the question is, wh what about, you know, where's the CUP side of this? Um, well, that's the interesting thing. It's the one thing I explain in my book. Um, it looks like it's going to be impossible to write the CUP side because, and because the CUP, all the documents of the CUP party were destroyed or lost or vanished at the end of World War I, uh, which, which is actually a benefit for me personally because I can say, look, you can't even write Ottoman history for this period. I mean, all these, you know, Justin McCarthy, Stanford Shaw, they write Ottoman history. Hey, guess what, guys? You don't have the documents for this period. In fact, the best information on what was going on inside the CUP for this period is probably in the ARF archives. That's what I was looking at. In internal analysis, you know, I mean, they're meeting with Talat on a regular basis. They're meeting with Javi. They're, you know, they're they're working with the locals in con with the key figures in Constantinople. Um, so it doesn't exist. Even uh, Shukru um, Hanioglu, who has written a who has written two books about uh, using the internal papers. Although the party papers have disappeared, they are the personal papers of many of the CUP leaders. He's written two books about that, which are excellent. But so he's only gone up to the period. To, he's only gone up to 1908. Uh, is he ever going to write the rest? I don't know. But uh, as of this point, the, probably the best analysis of the internal political uh, uh, situation I hope you can find in the ARF archives and from what I've written. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you think it was a mistake to appeal to the European countries to help put through the reforms just before World War II? One started. Do you think that had anything to do with that decision to carry out a genocide? I don't think so. I mean, you you can always say, yeah. D did it inflame them more? Sure. Oh, the question is, was it a mistake to appeal to the Europeans just uh, dur uh, during the negotiations before World War? First of all, they didn't know World War One was coming. So, I mean, in retrospect, we can say, oh well, you know, maybe you shouldn't have done that. The war was coming. You know, 
who knew that uh, you know who knew that was even going to happen? Who knew even if a war came? Who knew the Turks were going to get into it? I mean, the one thing I didn't mention. I mean, the first thing the ARF said when the CUP uh, said, "Hey, look, we're getting this way," I said, "Don't do it. This will end your empire. Do not get into it." You know, this is the worst thing that could happen for. I mean, they, you know, saying, "Hey, we, we may not be working together, but you know, you're crazy." So I mean, you know, so that, that's one thing. I don't think it really would have made a difference. Um, but as I said, all the way back to the 1890s, any time the Armenians appealed to Europe, uh, they were damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, you know, you're in a no-win situation. You have no chance of improving your... you're trying everything. I mean, the Armenians had just spent three years doing everything within the Ottoman constitutional system to try to get the Turks to improve it themselves. They won't. Your only option then is Europe. And so, my, had the war not broken out, the fact that they were getting European inspectors general, probably would have been a huge improvement. Because any time you have these situations where there's massacres, where the Kurds are coming through and, 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 and stealing land or, or destroying villages, you actually would have had someone overseeing it who would have had to order the Turkish gendarmes arrest these people. And a little bit, that the, the CUP actually did a little bit of that just in the 1908-1909 period. That was part, the, the thing I forgot to mention, they actually did arrest and they hanged a couple people. And that helped stop the initial attacks. They said, oh, wait a minute, maybe these people are serious. So, you know, we can do with high... I don't think it really would have made a difference, though. Had they or had they not, the, 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 the issue had, had much deeper roots than just what had happened in 1913. They had, had saw a long-standing problem with the Armenians dating back decades, and they thought they were going to get rid of it all at once. Thank you. Uh, the last two comments segue into the two questions I have. The first is... Um, you talked about the delay in implementing the Inspector General. If that had happened in 1913, do you think that that would have changed the situation on the ground enough to have an impact? Assuming that World War One happened when it did, assuming that you know the the intent uh, to commit genocide was there as it, as it was, would that have had, had any effect on the on the uh, genocide? Um, the second question is um, based on the fact that you're. Um, you know, the documents that you were able to read gave you um, a great deal of insight into the interactions between the ARF and, and key young Turk leaders. Did you discover anything that's different in the kinds of uh, portraits that you got of the young Turk leaders, um, many of whom were obviously um, big players in the genocide, and the kinds of portraits we get from, for instance, Morgenthau? Good question. Um, the second question is the portraits of the CUP leaders that I find in the documents that are different than what we know. The first question is whether, had the inspectors general Europeans come in 1913, could that have made a difference when the genocide came? That first one is a tough one. Um, the one thing I think it would have made a difference, I mean, the Armenians would have been more secure. There would have been, you know, maybe, you know, they, 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 they would have been solid ground, and perhaps, <coughs> I mean, well, who knows? The one thing that might have happened is that it might have been easier to set up self-defense mechanisms if you actually had a European overseer than if you know you're, st you're still dealing with the raids by the Tur Turkish army, and uh, Turkish police. At the same time, though, you think maybe it's the opposite. Maybe they, if they saw that you know the Europeans are overseeing it, oh, we don't want you know we don't want to be accused of undermining the Europeans. We better keep the arms out. So, uh, I I uh, I I couldn't you know it's hard to even guess. But the fact that you'd actually would have more of a European presence. Had you know, it might have depended on what would happen when the war did break out. Um, I mean, you know, the, the European, if they were already there, if they were already established, maybe they could have seen what was, you know, maybe they would have kept more of an eye on um, the CUP, so they couldn't have gotten away with it. that. Might be the one thing. Extra set of European eyes because I mean, one was a Norwegian, the other one was a, a, a Dutchman. Not you know, they were. I mean, the Dutch actually neither were actually in, in, in at war with the. Ottomans, had they already been there and established, they might have been additional observers that might have helped. Uh, as far as the portraits, the only real portrait, the only thing, in fact, maybe this goes to Nubar's question about the surprise, is the portrait of Talat. That's the only one I found a lot of detail on. Because believe it or not, the one CUP member they met with the most, and who was most sympathetic, and who seemed to be most progressive, particularly on the lands issue, was, believe it or not, Talat Pasha. And, the one, and I can't come to a final, the, the, the question that goes in my mind is, okay, was he a great actor? Was he just lying through this entire thing? And, you know, and, or 
Was it a fact that, you know, he, he was really sincerely trying, and I tend to lean maybe towards the second, although, you know, I can't make a determinative thing, that he was really trying. He thought that, yes, let's try, let's try this constitutional system. But as the CUP kept getting hammered, as they kept losing <clears throat> lands, as the Europeans kept taking advantage, they said, oh, the, this constitutionalism isn't working. Every time we try to be nice, our opponents within the Turkish, with, you know, the Turkish opponents keep taking shots at us. We keep losing power. I tried it. I tried it. Oh, to hell with it. I'm going the other way. You know, maybe, maybe he was so offended by the fact that the ARF had been so close to him and then wasn't. He decided to take it out on the Armenians. I'm not sure. I, I tend to think it was an evolution within Talat rather than him being a fantastic liar who met with the Armenians for months and months and worked with them and suddenly said, uh huh, uh -huh now I'm going to get them. Okay. I have a lot of confusion. My father was constant. I mean, I'm in a republic, you know. And he related that they used to smuggle a newspaper, I guess it was the Trochak in Geneva. Mm -hmm. So there must have been a group in Geneva as well. Where were our leaders? Ezra was one place, another place, police mm -hmm. Jerusalem, they had another one? Well, there were central committees throughout the world. Um, I got a series of them, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, uh, the question has to do with, the, I mean, it's the, the main, the main, I mean, there were central committees established in all the major Armenian population centers. The central committees reported to the bureaus. Um, the ones that are in some of the eastern provinces reported to Erzurum, the eastern bureau, the ones from, like, say, uh, Kharpert and the western provinces reported to, to Bolis. Uh, and then, and, and so, and so you had central committees, and of course you had Gomides below them. So that was the general structure. Um, Troshak had to be smuggled in, that's true. Once 1908 came, though, it became legal for the ARF to publish its own newspapers, so it published one in Erzurum, it published a second one in, in Bolis. Uh, second question. I remember, I have a copy, thanks to Mark Kalushin, of a newspaper, of a Mac, large Heidenik, Platsarik Heidenik, it was called. It was designed to, the, whatever the proceeds they got from a, was to supply guns to Ezra. Mm -hmm. The date was 1912. I remember my father's first cousin, who was a big ARF guy, Marcos de Maria. My father had a huge ad in the uh, Real estate insurance would be helpful with that. Now that was to raise the Sus one. Mm -hmm. This is 1912. Right. What else do I recollect? Well, actually, uh, let me yeah. let me let me let me make a couple comments on that. The United States played the Armenian community here in the United States played a key role uh, in funding all the activities of the ARF. In fact. It's, it, it's the interesting thing. As you look through the documents, there's letters that the Bureau sends to Egypt, they send, a, you know, they send to all their, to Egypt, to France, to Greece, to, you know, Syria, wherever it might be. But where there would be a two-page letter explaining things to Syria, and a three-page letter explaining things to Egypt, the same month, the same week that they're writing, they're sending a six- or seven-page letter to the, United, to the ARF body here in, the United, here in based in Watertown. Why? Because it was a, the, the eastern U.S. was critical. One, for fundraising, for producing the funds to, 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 to buy the arms, to fund the party. And two, so much of the ARF leadership and the key intelligentsia was in the Heidenick building, the old Heidenick that was uh, in Boston. So the, this region, so I mean, I'm not surprised by that Heidenick Patsarik Ter, because that was one of the key. And the reason it would be for Sassun and be for Harpet is that you had communities here from Sassun from Harpet. You don't tell Harpet, see, please let us buy guns in Erzurum. You tell Harpet, see, we're going to buy guns to protect Harpet. I mean, you know, it's logical. Okay. Yep, Greg? Uh, yeah, I just uh, finished a book on um, a German council during World War I, uh, uh, Mark David Schoenberg. And um, he, he does a uh, report to his chancellor talking about, which basically lays out the, uh, very concise, lays out the Armenian genocide. The Turks have decided that they want to eliminate the Armenian population, and they're going to use this, um, uh, this pretext. And he does it in an interesting way. He says that the, uh, the, the Turks are going to uh, dangle in front of the Antan um, a, a, a supposed revolt by the Tashnad party. And it always struck me as odd. It's not just a revolt by the Armenians and 
or anybody in particular, in, in, in the Entente. Uh, what was it about the Taj Mahal and the Entente that uh, 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 mean something? What was it that would mean anything to the Entente? Ah, uh, the, 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 the question is, when Schäuben Richtner is writing to uh, the German consul's writing, he's saying the pretense that can be used for the genocide is a, a, a Tashnag revolt. Um, well, Bank Ottoman, uh, the Fedai groups, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, I mean, every Euro all the European powers knew the ARF from Bank Ottoman. The Hunchags, in fact, had been the stronger party for the great, for a greatest period, but starting when they split, when they had a split in 1898, from that period on, a large number joined the ARF and, and they were actually secondary. So that the Tushnug in all mines, whether it's in Ottoman mines or uh, all consuls, that's the part they, they read about. And it's, it's funny to read the British consuls describe the Tushnugs. Uh, you know, you know, detail, I mean, some of it, a fair amount of it derogatory. Uh, some of it, you know, backhanded compliments as well. It's just, they were seen as the main power. They were the ones doing things. And the fact that it, their power was not just within the Ottoman Empire, but also within the Russian Empire, put them on a whole different level. You know, here, you know, these guys made the Tsar back down, you know, maybe they, maybe they do do something. You know, they're up to something. Yep. Let's uh, break. And uh, thank you. <laughs>